Welcome to this video of three short stories by H.G. Wells. I'll be narrating The Strange Orchid, The Argonauts of the Air, and A Moth, Genus Unknown. All three short stories appear in 30 Strange Stories by H.G. Wells, published in 1898. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. The Strange Orchid by H.G. Wells. Narrated by William Sky. The buying of orchids always has in it a certain speculative flavour. You have before you the brown shriveled lump of tissue, and for the rest you must trust your judgement, or the auctioneer, or your good luck as your taste may incline. The plant may be moribund or dead, or it may just be a respectable purchase, fair value for your money, or perhaps, for the thing has happened again and again, there slowly unfolds before the delighted eyes of the happy purchaser, day after day, some new variety, some novel richness, a strange twist of the labellum, or some subtler coloration or unexpected mimicry. Pride, beauty, and profit blossom together on one delicate green spike, and, it may be, even immortality, for the new miracle of nature may stand in need of a new specific name, and what so convenient as that of its discoverer? John Smithier. There have been worse names. It was perhaps the hope of some such happy discovery that made Winter Wedderburn such a frequent attendant at these sales. That hope, and also maybe the fact that he had nothing else of the slightest interest to do in the world. He was a shy, lonely, rather ineffectual man, provided with just enough income to keep off the spur of necessity, and not enough nervous energy to make him seek any exacting employments. He might have collected stamps or coins or translated Horace or bound books or invented new species of diatoms, but as it happened, he grew orchids and had one ambitious little hothouse. I have a fancy, he said over his coffee, that something is going to happen to me today. He spoke, as he moved and thought, slowly. Oh, don't say that, said his housekeeper, who was also his remote cousin for something happening was a euphemism that meant only one thing to her. You misunderstand me. I mean nothing unpleasant, though what I do mean I scarcely know. Today, he continued after a pause, Peters are going to sell a batch of plants from the Andamans and the Indies. I shall go up and see what they have. It may be I shall buy something good unawares. That may be it. He passed his cup for his second cupful of coffee. "'Are these the things collected by that poor young fellow you told me of the other day?' asked his cousin as she filled his cup. "'Yes,' he said, and became meditative over a piece of toast. "'Nothing ever does happen to me,' he remarked presently, beginning to think aloud. "'I wonder why. Things enough happen to other people. There is Harvey. Only the other week, on Monday, he picked up sixpence. On Wednesday his chicks all had the staggers. On Friday his cousin came home from Australia, and on Saturday he broke his ankle. What a whirl of excitement, compared to me. I think I would rather be without so much excitement, said his housekeeper. It can't be good for you. I suppose it's troublesome. Still, you see, nothing ever happens to me. When I was a little boy I never had accidents. I never fell in love as I grew up never married. I wonder how it feels to have something happen to you, something really remarkable. That orchid collector was only thirty-six, twenty years younger than myself, when he died. And he had been married twice and divorced once. He had had malarial fever four times, and once he broke his thigh. He killed a Malay once, and once he was wounded by a poisoned dart. And in the end he was killed by jungle leeches. It must have all been very troublesome, but then it must have been very interesting, you know, except perhaps the leeches. I am sure it was not good for him, said the lady with conviction. Perhaps not. And then Wedderburn looked at his watch. Twenty-three minutes past eight. I am going up by the quarter to twelve train so that there is plenty of time. I think I shall wear my alpaca jacket. It is quite warm enough. And my grey felt hat and brown shoes. I suppose, he glanced out of the window at the serene sky and sunlit garden, and then nervously at his cousin's face, 
I think you had better take an umbrella if you're going to London, she said in a voice that admitted of no denial. There's all between here and the station coming back. When he returned, he was in a state of mild excitement. He had made a purchase. It was rare that he could make up his mind quickly enough to buy, but this time he had done so. There are Vandas, he said, and a Dendrobe, and some Palaeonophis. He surveyed his purchases lovingly as he consumed his soup. They were laid out on the spotless tablecloth before him, and he was telling his cousin all about them as he slowly meandered through his dinner. It was his custom to live all his visits to London over again in the evening for her and his own entertainment. I knew something would happen today, and I have bought all these. Some of them, some of them, I feel sure, do you know, that some of them will be remarkable. I don't know how it is, but I feel just as sure as if someone had told me that some of these will turn out remarkable. That one, he pointed to a shriveled rhizome, was not identified. It may be a Palaeonophis, or it may not. It may be a new species, or even a new genus. And it was the last that poor batter never collected. I don't like the look of it, said his housekeeper. It's such an ugly shape. To me it scarcely seems to have a shape. I don't like those things that stick out, said his housekeeper. It shall be put away in a pot tomorrow. It looks, said the housekeeper, like a spider shamming dead. Wedderburn smiled and surveyed the root with his head on one side. It is certainly not a pretty lump of stuff, but you can never judge of these things from their dry appearance. It may turn out to be a very beautiful orchid indeed. How busy I shall be tomorrow! I must see tonight just exactly what to do with these things, and tomorrow I shall set to work. They found poor Batten lying dead, or dying, in a mangrove swamp. I forget which. He began again presently. With one of these very orchids crushed up under his body. He had been unwell for some days with some kind of native fever, and I suppose he fainted. These mangrove swamps are very unwholesome. Every drop of blood, they say, was taken out of him by the jungle leeches. It may be that very plant cost him his life to obtain. I think none the better of it for that. Men must work, though women may weep, said Wedderburn with profound gravity. Fancy dying away from every comfort in a nasty swamp. Fancy being ill of fever with nothing to take but chlorodyne and quinine. If men were left to themselves, they would live on chlorodyne and quinine, and no one round you but horrible natives. They say the Andaman Islanders are most disgusting wretches, and anyhow they can scarcely make good nurses, not having the necessary training, and just for people in England to have orchids. I don't suppose it was comfortable, but some men seem to enjoy that kind of thing, said Wedderburn. Anyhow, the natives of his party were sufficiently civilised to take care of all his collection, until his colleague, who was an ornithologist, came back again from the interior, though they could not tell the species of the orchid, and had let it wither. And it makes these things more interesting. It makes them disgusting. I should be afraid of some of the malaria clinging to them. And just think, there has been a dead body lying across that ugly thing. I never thought of that before. There! I declare I cannot eat another mouthful of dinner. I will take them off the table, if you like, and put them in the window seat. I can see them just as well there. The next few days he was indeed singularly busy in his steamy little hothouse, fussing about with charcoal, lumps of teak, moss, and all the other mysteries of the orchid cultivator. He considered he was having a wonderfully eventful time. In the evening he would talk about these new orchids to his friends, and over and over again he reverted to his expectation of something strange. Several of the Vandus and the Dendrobium died under his care, but presently the strange orchid began to show signs of life, he was delighted, and took his housekeeper right away from jam-making to see it at once. Directly he made the discovery. "'That is a bud,' he said. "'And presently there will be a lot of leaves there, and those little things coming out here are aerial rootlets. "'They look to me like little white fingers poking out of the brown. I don't like them,' said his housekeeper. "'Why not?' "'I don't know. They look like fingers trying to get at you. I can't help my likes and dislikes.' I don't know for certain, but I don't think there are any orchids I know that have aerial rootlets quite like that. It may be my fancy, of course. You see, they are a little flattened at the ends. I don't like them, said his housekeeper, suddenly shivering and turning away. 
I know it's very silly of me, and I'm very sorry, particularly as you like the thing so much, but I can't help thinking of that corpse. But it may not be that particular plant. That was merely a guess of mine. His housekeeper shrugged her shoulders. Anyhow, I don't like it, she said. Wedderburn felt a little hurt at her dislike to the plant, but that did not prevent his talking to her about orchids generally, and this orchid in particular, whenever he felt inclined. There are such queer things about orchids, he said one day, such possibilities of surprises. You know, Darwin studied their fertilization and showed that the whole structure of an ordinary orchid flower was contrived in order that moths might carry the pollen from plant to plant. Well, it seems that there are lots of orchids known, the flower of which cannot possibly be used for fertilization in that way. Some of the cypripediums, for instance. There are no insects known that can possibly fertilize them, and some of them have never been found with seed. But how do they form new plants? By runners and tubers and that kind of outgrowth. That is easily explained. The puzzle is, what are the flowers for? Very likely, he added, my orchid may be something extraordinary in that way. If so, I shall study it. I have often thought of making researches, as Darwin did, but hitherto I have not found the time, or something else has happened to prevent it. The leaves are beginning to unfold now. I do wish you would come and see them. But she said that the orchid house was so hot it gave her the headache. She had seen the plant once again, and the aerial rootlets, which were now some of them more than a foot long, had unfortunately reminded her of tentacles reaching out after something, and they got into her dreams, growing after her with incredible rapidity. So that she had settled to her entire satisfaction that she would not see that plant again, and Wedderburn had to admire its leaves alone. They were of the ordinary broad form, and a deep glossy green, with splashes and dots of deep red towards the base. He knew of no other leaves quite like them. The plant was placed on a low bench near the thermometer, and close by was a simple arrangement by which a tap dripped on the hot water pipes and kept the air steamy. And he spent his afternoons now, with some regularity, meditating on the approaching flowering of this strange plant. And at last the great thing happened. Directly he entered the little glass house, he knew that the spike had burst out, although his great Palaeonophis Loe hid the corner where his new darling stood. There was a new odour in the air, a rich, intensely sweet scent, that overpowered every other in that crowded, steaming little greenhouse. Directly he noticed this, he hurried down to the strange orchid. And behold, the trailing green spikes bore now three great splashes of blossom, from which this overpowering sweetness proceeded. He stopped before them in an ecstasy of admiration. The flowers were white, with streaks of golden orange upon the petals. The heavy labellum was coiled into an intricate projection, and a wonderful bluish purple mingled there with the gold. He could see at once that the genus was altogether a new one. And the insufferable scent! How hot the place was! The blossoms swam before his eyes. He would see if the temperature was right. He made a step towards the thermometer. Suddenly everything appeared unsteady. The bricks on the floor were dancing up and down. Then the white blossoms, the green leaves behind them. The whole greenhouse seemed to sweep sideways, and then in a curve upward. At half-past four, his cousin made the tea, according to their invariable custom. But Wedderburn did not come in for his tea. He is worshipping that horrid orchid, she told herself and waited ten minutes. His watch must have stopped. I will go and call him. She went straight to the hothouse and, opening the door, called his name. There was no reply. She noticed that the air was very close and loaded with an intense perfume. Then she saw something lying on the bricks between the hot water pipes. For a minute, perhaps, she stood motionless. He was lying face upward at the foot of the strange orchid. The tentacle-like aerial rootlets no longer swayed freely in the air, but were crowded together, a tangle of grey ropes, and stretched tight with their ends closely applied to his chin and neck and hands. She did not understand. Then she saw from under one of the exultant tentacles upon his cheek there trickled a little thread of blood. With an inarticulate cry, she ran towards him and tried to pull him away from the leech-like suckers. She snapped two of these tentacles and their sap dripped red. Then the overpowering scent of the blossom began to make her head reel. How they clung to him! She tore at the tough ropes and he and the white inflorescences swam about her. She felt she was fainting, knew she must not. She left him and hastily opened the nearest door, and, after she had panted for a moment in the fresh air, 
She had a brilliant inspiration. She caught up a flower pot and smashed in the windows at the end of the greenhouse. Then she re-entered. She tugged now with renewed strength at Wedderburn's motionless body and brought the strange orchid crashing to the floor. It still clung with the grimmest tenacity to its victim. In a frenzy, she lugged it and him into the open air. Then she thought of tearing through the sucker rootlets one by one, and in another minute she had released him and was dragging him away from the horror. He was white and bleeding from a dozen circular patches. The odd job man was coming up the garden, amazed at the smashing of glass, and saw her emerge, hauling the inanimate body with red-stained hands. For a moment he thought impossible things. "'Bring some water!' she cried, and her voice dispelled his fancies. When, with unnatural alacrity, he returned with the water, he found her weeping with excitement, and with Wedderburn's head upon her knee, wiping the blood from his face. "'What's the matter?' said Wedderburn, opening his eyes feebly and closing them again at once. "'Go and tell Annie to come out here to me, and then go for Dr. Haddon at once,' she said to the odd job man so soon as he brought the water, and added, seeing he hesitated, "'I will tell you all about it when you come back.' Presently Wedderburn opened his eyes again, and seeing that he was troubled by the puzzle of his position, she explained to him, "'You fainted in the hothouse.' "'And the orchid?' "'I will see to that.' she said. Wedderburn had lost a great deal of blood, but beyond that he had suffered no very great injury. They gave him brandy, mixed with some pink extract of meat, and carried him upstairs to bed. His housekeeper told her incredible story in fragments to Dr. Haddon. "'Come to the orchid house and see,' she said. The cold outer air was blowing in through the open door, and the sickly perfume was almost dispelled." Most of the torn aerial rootlets lay already withered amidst a number of dark stains upon the bricks. The stem of the inflorescence was broken by the fall of the plant, and the flowers were growing limp and brown at the edges of the petals. The doctor stooped towards it, then saw that one of the aerial rootlets still stirred feebly, and hesitated. The next morning the strange orchid still lay there, black now and putrescent. The door banged intermittingly in the morning breeze, and all the array of Wedderburn's orchids was shriveled and prostrate. But Wedderburn himself was bright and garrulous upstairs in the story of his strange adventure. The Argonauts of the Air by H. G. Wells Narrated by William Skye One saw Monson's flying machine from the windows of the trains passing either along the southwestern main line or along the line between Wimbledon and Worcester Park. To be more exact, one saw the huge scaffoldings which limited the flight of the apparatus. They rose over the treetops a massive alley of interlacing iron and timber and an enormous web of ropes and tackle, extending the best part of two miles. From the Leatherhead branch this alley was foreshortened and in part hidden by a hill with villas, but from the main line one had it in profile, a complex tangle of girders and curving bars, very impressive to the excursionists from Portsmouth and Southampton and the west. Monson had taken up the work where Maxim had left it, had gone on at first with an utter contempt for the journalistic wit and ignorance that had irritated and hampered his predecessor, and had spent, it was said, rather more than half his immense fortune upon his experiments. The results, to an impatient generation, seemed inconsiderable. When some five years had passed after the growth of the colossal iron groves at Worcester Park, and Monson still failed to put in a fluttering appearance over Trafalgar Square, even the Isle of Wight trippers felt their liberty to smile. And such intelligent people as did not consider Monson a fool stricken with the mania for invention denounced him as being, for no particular reason, a self-advertising quack. Yet now and again a morning trainload of season ticket holders would see a white monster rush headlong through the airy tracery of guides and bars, and hear the further stays, nettings and buffers snap, creak and groan with the impact of the blow. Then there would be an efflorescence of black-set white-rimmed faces along the sides of the train, and the morning papers would be neglected for a vigorous discussion of the possibility of flying in which nothing new was ever said by any chance, until the train reached Waterloo and its cargo of season ticket holders dispersed themselves over London. Or the fathers and mothers in some multitudinous train of weary excursionists returning exhausted from a day of rest by the sea would find the dark fabric standing out against the evening sky useful in diverting some bilious child from its introspection 
and be suddenly startled by the swift transit of a huge black flapping shape that strained upward against the guides. It was a great and forcible thing beyond dispute, and excellent for conversation, yet all the same it was but flying in leading strings, and most of those who witnessed it scarcely counted its flight as flying. More of a switchback, it seemed, to the run of the folk. Monson, I say, did not trouble himself very keenly about the opinions of the press at first, but possibly he even had formed but a poor idea of the time it would take before the tactics of flying were mastered, the swift assured adjustment of the big soaring shape to every gust and chance movement of the air. Nor had he clearly reckoned the money this prolonged struggle against gravitation would cost him, and he was not so pachydermatous as he seemed. Secretly, he had his periodical bundles of cuttings sent him by Romake. He had his periodical reminders from his banker, and if he did not mind the initial ridicule and scepticism, he felt the growing neglect as the months went by and the money dribbled away. Time was when Monson had sent the enterprising journalist, keen after readable matter, empty from his gates. But when the enterprising journalist ceased from troubling, Monson was anything but satisfied in his heart of hearts. Still, day by day, the work went on, and the multitudinous subtle difficulties of the steering diminished in number. Day by day, too, the money trickled away, until his balance was no longer a matter of hundreds of thousands, but of tens. And at last came an anniversary. Monson, sitting in the little drawing shed, suddenly noticed the date on Woodhouse's calendar. "'It was five years ago today that we began,' he said to Woodhouse suddenly. "'Is it?' said Woodhouse. "'It's the alterations play the devil with us,' said Monson, biting a paper fastener. The drawings for the new vans to the hinder screw lay on the table before him as he spoke. He pitched the mutilated brass paper fastener into the waste paper basket and drummed with his fingers. These alterations! Will the mathematicians ever be clever enough to save all this patching and experimenting? Five years learning by rule of thumb when one might think that it was possible to calculate the whole thing out beforehand. The cost of it! I might have hired three senior wranglers for life but they'd only have developed some beautifully useless theorems in pneumatics. What a time it has been, Woodhouse! These mouldings will take three weeks, said Woodhouse, at special prices. Three weeks, said Monson, and sat drumming. Three weeks certain, said Woodhouse, an excellent engineer, but no good as a comforter. He drew the sheets towards him and began shading a bar. Monson stopped drumming and began to bite his fingernails, staring the while at Woodhouse's head. "'How long have they been calling this Monson's folly?' he said suddenly. "'Oh, a year or so,' said Woodhouse carelessly, without looking up. Monson sucked the air in between his teeth and went to the window. The stout iron columns carrying the elevated rails upon which the start of the machine was made rose up close by, and the machine was hidden by the upper edge of the window. Through the grove of iron pillars, red-painted and ornate with rows of bolts, one had a glimpse of the pretty scenery towards Escher. A train went gliding noiselessly across the middle distance, its rattle drowned by the hammering of the workmen overhead. Monson could imagine the grinning faces at the windows of the carriages. He swore savagely under his breath and dabbed viciously at a blowfly that suddenly became noisy on the window pane. "'What's up?' said Woodhouse, staring in surprise at his employer. "'I'm about sick of this!' Woodhouse scratched his cheek. Oh, he said after an assimilating pause. He pushed the drawing away from him. Hear these fools, I'm trying to conquer a new element, trying to do a thing that will revolutionise life, and instead of taking an intelligent interest, they grin and make their stupid jokes and call me and my appliances names. Asses, said Woodhouse, letting his eye fall again on the drawing. The epithet, curiously enough, made Monson wince. I'm about sick of it, Woodhouse, anyhow he said after a pause. Woodhouse shrugged his shoulders. "'There's nothing for it but patience, I suppose,' said Monson, sticking his hands in his pockets. "'I've started. I've made my bed and I've got to lie on it. I can't go back. I'll see it through and spend every penny I have and every penny I can borrow, but I tell you, Woodhouse, I'm infernally sick of it all the same. If I'd paid a tenth part of the money towards some political greaser's expenses, I'd have been a baronet before this.' Monson paused. Woodhouse stared in front of him with a blank expression he always employed to indicate sympathy, and tapped his pencil case on the table. Monson stared at him for a minute. "'Oh, 
Damn, said Monson suddenly and abruptly rushed out of the room. Woodhouse continued his sympathetic rigour for perhaps half a minute. Then he sighed and resumed the shading of the drawings. Something had evidently upset Monson. Nice chap and generous, but difficult to get on with. It was the way with every amateur who had anything to do with engineering. Wanted everything finished at once. But Monson had usually the patience of the expert. Odd he was so irritable. Nice and round that aluminium rod did look now. Woodhouse threw back his head and put it, first this side and then that, to appreciate his bit of shading better. Mr. Woodhouse, said Hooper, the foreman of the labourers, putting his head in at the door. Hello, said Woodhouse, without turning around. Nothing happened, sir, said Hooper. Happened, said Woodhouse. The governor just been up the rail, swearing like a tornado. Oh, said Woodhouse. It ain't like him, sir. No? And I was thinking, perhaps... Don't think, said Woodhouse, still admiring the drawings. Hooper knew Woodhouse, and he shut the door suddenly with a vicious slam. Woodhouse stared stonily before him for some further minutes, and then made an ineffectual effort to pick his teeth with his pencil. Abruptly he desisted, pitched that old, tried and stumpy servitor across the room, got up, stretched himself, and followed Hooper. He looked ruffled. It was visible to every workman he met. When a millionaire who has been spending thousands on experiments that employ quite a little army of people suddenly indicates that he is sick of the undertaking, there is almost invariably a certain amount of mental friction in the ranks of the little army he employs. And even before he indicates his intentions, there are speculations and murmurs, a watching of faces and a study of straws. Hundreds of people knew before the day was out that Monson was ruffled, Woodhouse ruffled, Hooper ruffled. A workman's wife, for instance, whom Monson had never seen, decided to keep her money in the savings bank instead of buying a velveteen dress. So far reaching are even the casual curses of a millionaire. Monson found a certain satisfaction in going on the works and behaving disagreeably to as many people as possible. After a time even that palled upon him, and he rode off the grounds to everyone's relief there, and through the lane southeastward to the infinite tribulation of his house steward at Cheam. And the immediate cause of it all, the little grain of annoyance that had suddenly precipitated all this discontent with his life-work was, these trivial things that direct all our great decisions, half a dozen ill-considered remarks made by a pretty girl, prettily dressed, with a beautiful voice and something more than prettiness in her soft grey eyes. And of those half-dozen remarks, two words especially, Monson's folly. She had felt she was behaving charmingly to Monson, she reflected the next day how exceptionally effective she had been, and no one would have been more amazed than she had she learned the effect she had left on Monson's mind. I hope, considering everything, that she never knew. How are you getting on with your flying machine? she asked. I wonder if I shall ever meet anyone with a sense not to ask that, thought Monson. It will be very dangerous at first, will it not? Thinks I'm afraid. Jorgen is going to play presently. Have you heard him before? My mania being attended to, we turned a rational conversation. Gush about Jorgen, gradual decline of conversation ending with, You must let me know when your flying machine is finished, Mr. Monson, and then I will consider the advisability of taking a ticket. One would think I was still playing inventions in the nursery. But the bitterest thing she said was not meant for Monson's ears. To Phlox, the novelist, she was always conscientiously brilliant. I have been talking to Mr. Monson, and he can't think of nothing, positively nothing, but that flying machine of his. Do you know, all his workmen call that place of his Monson's folly. He is quite impossible. It is really very, very sad. I always regard him myself in the light of sunken treasure, the lost millionaire, you know. She was pretty and well-educated. Indeed, she had written an epigrammatic novelette, but the bitterness was that she was typical. She summarised what the world thought of the man who was working sanely, steadily and surely towards a more tremendous revolution in the appliances of civilization, a more far-reaching alteration in the ways of humanity than has ever been effected since history began. They did not even take him seriously. In a little while he would be proverbial. "'I must fly now,' he said on his way home, smarting with a sense of absolute social failure. "'I must fly soon. If it doesn't come off soon, by God!' I shall run amuck. He said that before he had gone through his passbook and his litter of papers. Inadequate as the cause seems, it was that girl's voice and the expression of her eyes that precipitated his discontent. 
but certainly the realisation that he had no longer even £100,000 worth of realisable property behind him was the poison that made the wound deadly. It was the next day after this that he exploded upon Woodhouse and his workmen, and thereafter his bearing was consistently grim for three weeks, and anxiety dwelt in Cheam and Ewell, Malden, Morden and Worcester Park, places that had thriven mightily on his experiments. Four weeks after that first swearing of his, he stood with Woodhouse by the reconstructed machine as it lay across the elevated railway, by means of which it gained its initial impetus. The new propeller glittered a brighter white than the rest of the machine, and a gilder, obedient to a whim of Monson's, was picking out the aluminium bars with gold, and looking down the long avenue between the ropes, gilded now with the sunset, one saw red signals, and two miles away an anthill of workmen busy altering the last falls of the run into a rising slope. "'I'll come,' said Woodhouse. "'I'll come right enough, but I tell you it's infernally foolhardy. "'If only you would give another year. "'I tell you I won't. "'I tell you the thing works. "'I've given years enough. "'It's not that,' said Woodhouse. "'We're all right with the machine, but it's the steering. "'Haven't I been rushing night and morning "'backwards and forwards through this squirrel's cage? "'If the thing steers true here, "'it will steer true all across England. "'It's just funk, I tell you, Woodhouse. "'We could have gone a year ago.' "'And besides—' "'Well,' said Woodhouse, "'the money!' snapped Monson over his shoulder. "'Hang it, I never thought of the money,' said Woodhouse, and then, speaking now in a very different tone to that with which he had said the words before, he repeated, "'I'll come. Trust me.' Monson turned suddenly and saw all that Woodhouse had not the dexterity to say, shining on his sunset-lit face. He looked for a moment, then impulsively extended his hand. "'Thanks,' he said. "'All right.' said Woodhouse, gripping the hand, and with a queer softening of his features. Trust me. Then both men turned to the big apparatus that lay with its flat wings extended upon the carrier, and stared at it meditatively. Monson, guided perhaps by a photographic study of the flight of birds, and by Lilienthal's methods, had gradually drifted from Maxim's shapes towards the bird form again. The thing, however, was driven by a huge screw behind in the place of the tail, and so hovering which needs an almost vertical adjustment of a flat tail, was rendered impossible. The body of the machine was small, almost cylindrical and pointed. Forward and aft on the pointed ends were two small petroleum engines, for the screw, and the navigators sat deep in a canoe-like recess, the foremost one steering and being protected by a low screen, with two plate-glass windows from the blinding rush of air. On either side a monstrous flat framework with a curved front border could be adjusted, so as either to lie horizontally or to be tilted upward or down. These wings worked rigidly together, or, by releasing a pin, one could be tilted through a small angle independently of its fellow. The front edge of either wing could also be shifted back so as to diminish the wing area about one-sixth. The machine was not only not designed to hover, but it was also incapable of fluttering. Monson's idea was to get into the air with the initial rush of the apparatus, and then to skim, much as a playing card may be skimmed, keeping up the rush by means of the screw at the stern. Rooks and gulls fly enormous distances in that way, with scarcely a perceptible movement of the wings. The bird really drives along on an aerial switchback. It glides slanting downward for a space until it has gained considerable momentum, and then altering the inclination of its wings, glides up again almost to its original altitude. Even a Londoner who has watched the birds in the aviary in Regent's Park knows that. But the bird is practising this art from the moment it leaves its nest. It has not only the perfect apparatus, but the perfect instinct to use it. A man off his feet has the poorest skill in balancing. Even the simple trick of the bicycle cost him some hours of labour. The instantaneous adjustments of the wings, the quick response to a passing breeze, the swift recovery of equilibrium, the giddy, eddying movements that require such absolute precision, all that he must learn, learn with infinite labour and infinite danger, if ever he is to conquer flying. The flying machine that will start off some fine day driven by neat little levers, with a nice open deck like a liner, and all loaded up with bombshells and guns, is the easy dreaming of a literary man. In lives and in treasure, the cost of the conquest of the empire of the air may even exceed all that has been spent in man's great conquest of the sea. Certainly it will be costlier than the greatest war that has ever devastated the world. No one knew these things better than these two practical men, and they knew they were in the front rank of the coming army. Yet there is hope even in a forlorn hope. Men are killed outright in the reserves sometimes, while others who have been left for dead in the thickest corner crawl out and survive. If we miss these meadows, 
said Woodhouse presently in his slow way. My dear chap, said Monson, whose spirits had been rising fitfully during the last few days, we mustn't miss these meadows. There's a quarter of a square mile for us to hit, fences removed, ditches levelled. We shall come down all right, rest assured. And if we don't... Ah, said Woodhouse, if we don't... Before the day of the start, the newspaper people got wind of the alterations at the northward end of the framework, and Monson was cheered by a decided change in the comments Romake forwarded him. He will be off some day, said the papers. He will be off some day, said the southwestern season ticket holders one to another, the seaside excursionists, the Saturday to Monday trippers from Sussex and Hampshire and Dorset and Devon, the eminent literary people from Hazelmere, all remarked eagerly one to another, he will be off some day, as the familiar scaffolding came in sight. And actually, one bright morning, in full view of the ten past ten train from Basingstoke, Monson's flying machine started on its journey. They saw the carrier running swiftly along its rail, and the white and gold screw spinning in the air. They heard the rapid rumble of wheels and a thud as the carrier reached the buffers at the end of its run. Then a whir as the flying machine was shot forward into the networks. All that the majority of them had seen and heard before. The thing went with a drooping flight through the framework and rose again, and then every beholder shouted or screamed or yelled or shrieked after his kind. For instead of the customary concussion and stoppage, the flying machine flew out of its five years' cage like a bolt from a crossbow, and drove slantingly upward into the air, curved round a little so as to cross the line, and soared in the direction of Wimbledon Common. It seemed to hang momentarily in the air and grow smaller, then it ducked and vanished over the clustering blue treetops to the east of Coombe Hill, and no one stopped staring and gasping until long after it had disappeared. That was what the people in the train from Basingstoke saw. If you had drawn a line down the middle of that train, from engine to guard's van, you would not have found a living soul on the opposite side to the flying machine. It was a mad rush from window to window as the thing crossed the line, and the engine driver and stoker never took their eyes off the low hills about Wimbledon, and never noticed that they had run clean through Coombe and Malden and Rains Park, until, with returning animation, they found themselves pelting at the most indecent pace into Wimbledon Station. From the moment when Monson had started the carrier with a NOW, neither he nor Woodhouse said a word. Both men sat with clenched teeth. Monson had crossed the line with a curve that was too sharp, and Woodhouse had opened and shut his white lips, but neither spoke. Woodhouse simply gripped his seat and breathed sharply through his teeth, watching the blue country to the west rushing past and down and away from him. Monson knelt at his post forward, and his hands trembled on the spoked wheel that moved the wings. He could see nothing before him but a mass of white clouds in the sky. The machine went slanting upward, travelling with an enormous speed still, but losing momentum every moment. The land ran away underneath with diminishing speed. Now, said Woodhouse at last, and with a violent effort, Monson wrenched over the wheel and altered the angle of the wings. The machine seemed to hang for half a minute motionless in mid-air, and then he saw the hazy blue house-covered hills of Kilburn and Hampstead jump up before his eyes and rise steadily, until the little sunlit dome of the Albert Hall appeared through his windows. For a moment he scarcely understood the meaning of this upward rush of the horizon, but as the nearer and nearer houses came into view, he realised what he had done. He had turned the wings over too far, and they were swooping steeply downward towards the Thames. The thought, the question, the realisation were all the business of a second of time. Too much! gasped Woodhouse. Monson brought the wheel halfway back with a jerk, and forthwith the Kilburn and Hampstead Ridge dropped again to the lower edge of his windows. They had been a thousand feet above Coombe and Malden Station. Fifty seconds after, they whizzed at a frightful pace, not eighty feet above the East Putney Station, on the Metropolitan District Line, to the screaming astonishment of a platform full of people. Monson flung up the vans against the air, and over Fulham they rushed up their atmospheric switch back again, steeply, too steeply. The buses went floundering across the Fulham road, the people yelled. Then down again, too steeply still, and the distant trees and houses about Primrose Hill leapt up across Monson's window, and then suddenly he saw straight before him the greenery of Kensington Gardens and the towers of the Imperial Institute. They were driving straight down upon South Kensington. The pinnacles of the Natural History Museum rushed up into view. There came one fateful second of swift thought, a moment of hesitation. Should he try and clear the towers, or swerve eastward? He made a hesitating attempt to release the right wing, left the catch half-released, and gave a frantic clutch at the wheel. The nose of the machine seemed to leap up before him. The wheel pressed his hand with irresistible force and jerked itself out of his control. 
Woodhouse, sitting crouched together, gave a hoarse cry and sprang up towards Monson. "'Too far!' he cried, and then he was clinging to the gunwale for dear life, and Monson had been jerked clean overhead and was falling backwards upon him. So swiftly had the thing happened that barely a quarter of the people going to and fro in Hyde Park and Brompton Road and the Exhibition Road saw anything of the aerial catastrophe. A distant winged shape had appeared above the clustering houses to the south, had fallen and risen, growing larger as it did so, had swooped swiftly down towards the Imperial Institute, a broad spread of flying wings, had swept round in a quarter circle, dashed eastward, and then suddenly sprang vertically into the air. A black object shot out of it and came spinning downward. A man! Two men clutching each other! They came whirling down, separated as they struck the roof of the students' club, and bounded off into the green bushes on its southward side. For perhaps half a minute the pointed stem of the big machine still pierced vertically upward, the screw spinning desperately. For one brief instant, that yet seemed an age to all who watched it, it had hung motionless in mid-air. Then a spout of yellow flame licked up its length from the stern engine, and swift, swifter, swifter, and flaring like a rocket, it rushed down upon the solid mass of masonry which was formerly the Royal College of Science. The big screw of white and gold touched the parapet and crumpled up like wet linen. Then the blazing spindle-shaped body smashed and splintered, smashing and splintering in its fall upon the north-westward angle of the building. But the crash, the flame of blazing paraffin that shot heavenward from the shattered engines of the machine, the crushed horrors that were found in the garden beyond the students' club, the masses of yellow parapet and red brick that fell headlong into the roadway, the running to and fro of people like ants in a broken anthill, the galloping of fire engines, the gathering of crowds. All these things do not belong to this story, which was written only to tell how the first of all successful flying machines was launched and flew. Though he failed, and failed disastrously, the record of Monson's work remains, a sufficient monument to guide the next of that band of gallant experimentalists who will sooner or later master this great problem of flying. And between Worcester Park and Malden, there still stands that portentous avenue of ironwork rusting now and dangerous here and there, to witness to the first desperate struggle for man's right of way through the air. If you're enjoying the stories, please activate the like button for this video. It helps me create more content like this. A Moth, Genus Unknown, by H. G. Wells Narrated by William Skye Probably you have heard of Hapley, not W.T. Hapley, the son, but the celebrated Hapley, the Hapley of Periplaneta Haplia, Hapley, the entomologist. If so, you know at least of the great feud between Hapley and Professor Porkins, though certain of its consequences may be new to you. For those who have not, a word or two of explanation is necessary, which the idle reader may go over with a glancing eye if his indolence so incline him. It is amazing how very widely diffused is the ignorance of such really important matters as the Hapley Porkins feud. Those epoch making controversies, again, that have convulsed the Geological Society are, I verily believe, almost entirely unknown outside the fellowship of that body. I have heard men of fair general education even refer to the great scenes at these meetings as vestry meeting squabbles. Yet the great hate of the English and Scotch geologists has lasted now half a century, and has left deep and abundant marks upon the body of the science. And this haply Porkins business, though perhaps a more personal affair, stirred passions as profound, if not profounder. Your common man has no conception of the zeal that animates a scientific investigator, the fury of contradiction you can arouse in him. It is the odium theologicum in a new form. There are men, for instance, who would gladly burn Professor Ray Lancaster at Smithfield for his treatment of the mollusca in the encyclopaedia. That fantastic extension of the cephalopods to cover the terpodos, but I wonder from Hapley and Porkins. It began years and years ago with a revision of the microlepidoptera, whatever these may be, by Porkins in which he extinguished a new species created by Hapley. Hapley, who was always quarrelsome, replied by a stinging impeachment of the entire classification of Porkins. Porkins, in his rejoinder, suggested that Hapley's microscope was as defective as his powers of observation, and called him an irresponsible meddler. Hapley was not a professor at that time. Hapley, in his retort, spoke of blundering collectors and described, as if inadvertently, Porkins's revision as a miracle of ineptitude. 
it was war to the knife. However, it would scarcely interest the reader to detail how these two great men quarrelled, and how the split between them widened until from the Microlepidoptera they were at war upon every open question in entomology. There were memorable occasions. At times, the Royal Entomological Society meetings resembled nothing so much as the Chamber of Deputies. On the whole, I fancy Porkins was nearer the truth than Hapley. But Hapley was skilled with his rhetoric, had a turn for ridicule, rare in a scientific man, was endowed with vast energy, and had a fine sense of injury in the matter of the extinguished species, while Porkins was a man of dull presence, prosy of speech, in shape not unlike a water barrel, over-conscientious with testimonials, and suspected of jobbing museum appointments. So the young men gathered round Hapley and applauded him. It was a long struggle, vicious from the beginning, and growing at last to pitiless antagonism. The successive turns of fortune, now an advantage to one side and now to another, now Hapley tormented by some success of Porkins, and now Porkins outshone by Hapley, belong rather to the history of entomology than to this story. But in 1891, Porkins, whose health had been bad for some time, published some work upon the mesoblast of the Death's Head Moth. What the mesoblast of the Death's Head Moth may be does not matter a rap in this story, but the work was far below his usual standard and gave Hapley an opening he had coveted for years. He must have worked night and day to make the most of his advantage. In an elaborate critique, he rent Porkins to tatters. One can fancy the man's disordered black hair and his queer dark eyes flashing as he went for his antagonist, and Porkins made a reply halting, ineffectual, with painful gaps of silence, and yet malignant. There was no mistaking his will to wound Hapley, nor his incapacity to do it, but few of those who heard him, I was absent from that meeting, realised how ill the man was. Hapley had got his opponent down and meant to finish him. He followed with a simply brutal attack upon Porkins in the form of a paper upon the development of moths in general, a paper showing evidence of a most extraordinary amount of mental labour and yet couched in a violently controversial tone. Violent as it was, an editorial note witnesses that it was modified. It must have covered Porkins with shame and confusion of face. It left no loophole, it was murderous in argument and utterly contemptuous in tone, an awful thing for the declining years of a man's career. The world of entomologists waited breathlessly for the rejoinder from Porkins. He would try one, for Porkins had always been game, but when it came it surprised them. For the rejoinder of Porkins was to catch the influenza, to proceed to pneumonia, and to die. It was perhaps as effectual a reply as he could make under the circumstances, and largely turned the current of feeling against Hapley. The very people who had most gleefully cheered on those gladiators became serious at the consequence. There could be no reasonable doubt the threat of the defeat had contributed to the death of Porkins. There was a limit even to scientific controversy, said serious people. Another crushing attack was already in the press and appeared on the day before the funeral. I don't think Hapley exerted himself to stop it. People remembered how Hapley had hounded down his rival and forgot that rival's defects. Scathing satire reads ill over fresh mould. The thing provoked comment in the daily papers. This it was that made me think that you had probably heard of Hapley in this controversy. But as I have already remarked, scientific workers live very much in a world of their own. Half the people, I dare say, who go along Piccadilly to the Academy every year, could not tell you where the learned societies abide. Many even think that research is a kind of happy family cage in which all kinds of men lie down together in peace. In his private thoughts, Hapley could not forgive Porkins for dying. In the first place, it was a mean dodge to escape the absolute pulverisation Hapley had in hand for him, and in the second it left Hapley's mind with a queer gap in it. For twenty years he had worked hard, sometimes far into the night and seven days a week, with microscope, scalpel, collecting net and pen, and almost entirely with reference to Porkins. The European reputation he had won had come as an incident in that great antipathy. He had gradually worked up to a climax in this last controversy. It had killed Porkins, but it had also thrown Hapley out of gear, so to speak, and his doctor advised him to give up work for a time and rest. So Hapley went down into a quiet village in Kent, and thought day and night of Porkins, and good things it was now impossible to say about him. At last Hapley began to realise in what direction the preoccupation tended. He determined to make a fight for it, and started by trying to read novels, 
But he could not get his mind off Porkins, white in the face and making his last speech, every sentence a beautiful opening for Hapley. He turned to fiction and found it had no grip on him. He read the Island Knights' entertainments until his sense of causation was shot beyond endurance by the bottle imp. Then he went to Kipling and found he proved nothing besides being irreverent and vulgar. These scientific people have their limitations. Then, unhappily, he tried Besant's In a House, and the opening chapter set his mind upon learned societies and Porkins at once. So Hapley turned to chess and found it a little more soothing. He soon mastered the moves and the chief gambits and commoner closing positions, and began to beat the vicar. But then the cylindrical contours of the opposite king began to resemble Porkins standing up and gasping ineffectually against Checkmate, and Hapley decided to give up chess. Perhaps the study of some new branch of science would after all be better diversion. The best rest is change of occupation. Hapley determined to plunge at diatoms and had one of his smaller microscopes and Halibut's monograph sent down from London. He thought that perhaps if he could get up a vigorous quarrel with Halibut, he might be able to begin life afresh and forget Porkins. And very soon he was hard at work in his habitual strenuous fashion at these microscopic denizens of the wayside pool. It was on the third day of the diatoms that Hapley became aware of a novel addition to the local fauna. He was working late at the microscope, and the only light in the room was the brilliant little lamp with a special form of green shade. Like all experienced microscopists, he kept both eyes open. It is the only way to avoid excessive fatigue. One eye was over the instrument, and bright and distinct before that was the circular field of the microscope, across which a brown diatom was slowly moving. With the other eye, Hapley saw, as it were, without seeing. He was only dimly conscious of the brass side of the instrument, the illuminated part of the tablecloth, a sheet of notepaper, the foot of the lamp, and the darkened room beyond. Suddenly, his attention drifted from one eye to the other. The tablecloth was of the material called tapestry by shopmen, and rather brightly coloured. The pattern was in gold, with a small amount of crimson and pale blue upon a greyish ground. At one point the pattern seemed displaced, and there was a vibrating movement of the colours at this point. Hapley suddenly moved his head back and looked with both eyes. His mouth fell open with astonishment. It was a large moth or butterfly, its wings spread in butterfly fashion. It was strange it should be in the room at all, for the windows were closed. Strange that it should not have attracted his attention when fluttering to its present position. Strange that it should match the tablecloth. Stranger far to him, Hapley, the great entomologist, it was altogether unknown. There was no delusion. It was crawling slowly towards the foot of the lamp. Genus unknown, by heavens! And in England! said Hapley, staring. Then he suddenly thought of Porkins. Nothing would have maddened Porkins more, and Porkins was dead. Something about the head and body of the insect became singularly suggestive of Porkins, just as the chess king had been. "'Confound Porkins!' said Hapley. "'But I must catch this.' And looking round him for some means of capturing the moth, he rose slowly out of his chair. Suddenly the insect rose, struck the edge of the lampshade, Hapley heard the ping, and vanished into the shadow. In a moment Hapley had whipped off the shade so that the whole room was illuminated. The thing had disappeared, but soon his practised eye detected it upon the wallpaper near the door. He went towards it, poising the lampshade for capture. Before he was within striking distance, however, it had risen and was fluttering round the room. After the fashion of its kind, it flew with sudden starts and turns, seeming to vanish here and reappear there. Once Hapley struck and missed, then again. The third time he hit his microscope. The instrument swayed, struck and overturned the lamp and fell noisily upon the floor. The lamp turned over on the table and very luckily went out. Hapley was left in the dark. With a start he felt the strange moth blunder into his face. It was maddening. He had no lights. If he opened the door of the room, the thing would get away. In the darkness he saw Porkins quite distinctly laughing at him. Porkins had ever an oily laugh. He swore furiously and stamped his foot on the floor. There was a timid rapping at the door. Then it opened, perhaps a foot, and very slowly. The alarmed face of the landlady appeared behind a pink candle flame. She wore a nightcap over her grey hair and had some purple garment over her shoulders. "'What was that fearful smash?' she said. "'Has anything?' The strange moth appeared fluttering about the chink of the door. "'Shut that door!' said Hapley, and suddenly rushed at her. The door slammed hastily. Hapley was left alone in the dark. 
Then in the pause he heard his landlady scuttle upstairs, lock her door, and drag something heavy across the room and put against it. It became evident to Hapley that his conduct and appearance had been strange and alarming. Confound the moth! And Porkins! However, it was a pity to lose the moth now. He felt his way into the hall and found the matches, after sending his hat down upon the floor with a noise like a drum. With a lighted candle he returned to the sitting room. No moth was to be seen. Yet once, for a moment, it seemed that the thing was fluttering round his head. Happily very suddenly decided to give up the moth and go to bed. But he was excited. All night long his sleep was broken by dreams of the moth, Porkins, and his landlady. Twice in the night he turned out and soused his head in cold water. One thing was very clear to him. His landlady could not possibly understand about the strange moth, especially as he had failed to catch it. No one but an entomologist would understand quite how he felt. She was probably frightened at his behaviour, and yet he failed to see how he could explain it. He decided to say nothing further about the events of last night. After breakfast, he saw her in her garden, and decided to go out to talk to her, to reassure her. He talked to her about beans and potatoes, bees, caterpillars, and the price of fruit. She replied in her usual manner, but she looked at him a little suspiciously, and kept walking as he walked, so that there was always a bed of flowers, or a row of beans, or something of the sort between them. After a while he began to feel singularly irritated at this, and to conceal his vexation went indoors and presently went out for a walk. The moth, or butterfly, trailing an odd flavour of porkins with it, kept coming into that walk, though he did his best to keep his mind off it. Once he saw it quite distinctly, with its wings flattened out upon the old stone wall that runs along the west edge of the park, but going up to it he found it was only two lumps of grey and yellow lichen. This, said happily, is the reverse of mimicry. Instead of a butterfly looking like a stone, here is a stone looking like a butterfly. Once something hovered and fluttered round his head, but by an effort of will he drove that impression out of his mind again. In the afternoon, Hapley called upon the vicar and argued with him upon theological questions. They sat in the little arbour covered with briar and smoked as they wrangled. Look at that moth, said Hapley, suddenly pointing to the edge of the wooden table. Where? said the vicar. "'You don't see a moth on the edge of the table there?' said Hapley. "'Certainly not,' said the vicar. Hapley was thunderstruck. He gasped. The vicar was staring at him. Clearly the man saw nothing. "'The eye of faith is no better than the eye of science,' said Hapley awkwardly. "'I don't see your point,' said the vicar, thinking it was part of the argument. That night Hapley found the moth crawling over his counterpane. He sat on the edge of the bed in his shirt sleeves and reasoned with himself. Was it pure hallucination? He knew he was slipping, and he battled for his sanity with the same silent energy he had formerly displayed against Porkins. So persistent his mental habit that he felt as if it was still a struggle with Porkins. He was well versed in psychology. He knew that such visual illusions do come as a result of mental strain. But the point was, he did not only see the moth, he had heard it when it touched the edge of the lampshade and afterwards when it hit against the wall, and he had felt it strike his face in the dark. He looked at it. It was not at all dreamlike, but perfectly clear and solid-looking in the candlelight. He saw the hairy body and the short feathery antennae, the jointed legs, even a place where the down was rubbed from the wing. He suddenly felt angry with himself for being afraid of a little insect. His landlady had got the servant to sleep with her that night, because she was afraid to be alone. In addition, she had locked the door and put the chest of drawers against it. They listened and talked in whispers after they had gone to bed, but nothing occurred to alarm them. About eleven, they had ventured to put the candle out and had both dozed off to sleep. They woke up with a start and sat up in bed, listening in the darkness. Then they heard slippered feet going to and fro in Hapley's room. A chair was overturned and there was a violent dab at the wall. Then a china mantle ornament smashed upon the fender. Suddenly the door of the room opened and they heard him upon the landing. They clung to one another, listening. He seemed to be dancing upon the staircase. Now he would go down three or four steps quickly, then up again, then hurry down into the hall. They heard the umbrella stand go over and the fanlight break. Then the bolt shot and the chain rattled. He was opening the door. They hurried to the window. It was a dim grey night, an almost unbroken sheet of watery cloud was sweeping across the moon and the hedge and trees in front of the house were black against the pale roadway. They saw Hapley looking like a ghost in his shirt and white trousers, 
running to and fro in the road and beating the air. Now he would stop, now he would dart very rapidly at something invisible, now he would move upon it with stealthy strides. At last he went out of sight up the road towards the down. Then, while they argued who should go down and lock the door, he returned. He was walking very fast, and he came straight into the house, closed the door carefully, and went quietly up to his bedroom. Then everything was silent. "'Mrs. Colville,' said Hapley, calling down the staircase next morning, "'I hope I did not alarm you last night.' "'You may well ask that,' said Mrs. Colville. "'The fact is, I am a sleepwalker, and the last two nights I have been without my sleeping mixture. There is nothing to be alarmed about, really. I am sorry I made such an ass of myself. I will go over the down to Shoreham and get some stuff to make me sleep soundly. I ought to have done that yesterday.' But halfway over the down, by the chalk pits, the moth came upon Hapley again. He went on, trying to keep his mind upon chess problems, but it was no good. The thing fluttered into his face, and he struck at it with his hat in self-defence. Then rage, the old rage, the rage he had so often felt against Borkins, returned once more. He went on, leaping and striking at the eddying insect. Suddenly he trod on nothing, and fell headlong. There was a gap in his sensations, and Hapley found himself sitting on the heap of flints in front of the opening of the chalk pits, with a leg twisted back under him. The strange moth was still fluttering round his head. He struck at it with his hand, and turning his head, saw two men approaching him. One was the village doctor. It occurred to Hapley that this was lucky. Then it came into his mind, with extraordinary vividness, that no one would ever be able to see the strange moth except himself, and that it behoved him to keep silent about it. Late that night, however, after his broken leg was set, he was feverish and forgot his self-restraint. He was lying flat on his bed, and he began to run his eyes round the room to see if the moth was still about. He tried not to do this, but it was no good. He soon caught sight of the thing resting close to his hand by the nightlight on the green tablecloth. The wings quivered. With a sudden wave of anger he smote at it with his fist, and the nurse woke up with a shriek. He had missed it. "'That moth!' he said, and then, "'It was fancy. Nothing!' All the time he could see quite clearly the insect going round the cornice and darting across the room, and he could also see that the nurse saw nothing of it and looked at him strangely. He must keep himself in hand. He knew he was a lost man if he did not keep himself in hand. But as the night waned, the fever grew upon him, and the very dread he had of seeing the moth made him see it. About five, just as the dawn was grey, he tried to get out of bed and catch it, though his leg was afire with pain. The nurse had to struggle with him. On account of this, they tied him down to the bed. At this the moth grew bolder, and once he felt it settle in his hair. Then, because he struck out violently with his arms, they tied these also. At this the moth came and crawled over his face, and happily wept, swore, screamed, prayed for them to take it off him unavailingly. The doctor was a blockhead, a half-qualified general practitioner and quite ignorant of mental science. He simply said there was no moth. Had he possessed the wit, he might still, perhaps, have saved Hapley from his fate by entering into his delusion and covering his face with gauze as he prayed might be done. But, as I say, the doctor was a blockhead, and until the leg was healed, Hapley was kept tied to his bed and with the imaginary moth crawling over him. It never left him while he was awake, and it grew to a monster in his dreams. While he was awake, he longed for sleep, and from sleep he awoke screaming. So now, Hapley is spending the remainder of his days in a padded room, worried by a moth that no one else can see. The asylum doctor calls it hallucination, but Hapley, when he is in his easier mood and can talk, says it is the ghost of Porkins, and consequently a unique specimen and well worth the trouble of catching. Thanks for watching and listening to this video. For more science fiction and fantasy stories like these, make sure to subscribe to this channel and check out the videos appearing on screen now.